Hello and welcome. Before we start, I wanted to say two things. First of all, there are some spoilers in this video. Uh, there are no story spoilers, but I do show some of the late game monsters. I know people in the Monster Hunter community don't like that. If you're someone that wants to experience the game fresh and be surprised by every monster, then don't watch this video. Just listen to the audio because I won't be spoiling anything through what I say. And I also will not be showing the last boss of the game at all. So don't worry, that's safe. Secondly, like I did with my Division video, I worked with a very talented graphic artist to create a special special edition of the script for this review. Uh, it's available exclusively to patrons. I'll leave a link in the description below. If you'd like that, go and check it out. Otherwise, I really hope you enjoy the review. Can we get drunk in the game? Mm. Does being drunk affect the stats in the game? Do you recommend being drunk while playing the game? <laughs> okay, so everyone is all like... Kind of one of those things that's a little bit like Dark Souls, in as much as nearly everybody knows someone who's into Monster Hunter, or you're aware of the fandom. Dark Souls and Monster Hunter. And whether or not they're similar, on one hand, I think they're incredibly different. But at the same time, they're incredibly similar as well. To some degree, it gets compared to Dark Souls, like there's a lot of deliberate animation priority going. Making the comparison between the two does nothing but simplifies two amazing and unique games into a mundane subgenre of difficult. Certain games should have identities and they should stick to them. That's why Dark Souls became so beloved is because they never ever curtail to any sense of how their difficulty should be. Basically the game wants to remain online in, a, in sort of the same way that a Dark Souls is kind of constantly online. It's always available to let other players jump in. Monster Hunter is the Dark Souls of Monster Hunter games. Well I say man Fuck that. You want to know what Monster Hunter is? Monster Hunter is the predator of video games. You are a fucking badass. You are going 1v1 toe to toe with a monster in the jungle who can mess you up if you make the slightest mistake. It's you and your weapon and your wits against something that would blow you up just as soon as look at you. It's not the explosive short lived thrill of Dark Souls. It's the long tense battle of wills of Arnold Schwarzenegger versus the predator. Or Alien, yes, it's Alien, it's totally Alien. It's like the end of Aliens when Ripley puts on that Loaderbot suit and says... Get away from her, you bitch! That's what this is. This isn't you finding your sack for a measly three minute boss battle against this jerk. It's a 50 minute boss battle against this thing. Or this thing. Or even Mario, for Christ's sake. It's just, okay, clearly I'm getting carried away. Let's dial it back a notch so that we have something to work up to. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about why Monster Hunter World is one of the greatest video games ever created. But before we do that, we need to set some ground rules about what we all mean when we say one of the greatest games ever made so that we don't end up like these poor bastards. In Australia, we've just had what's called our Triple J Hottest 100, which is a radio countdown event, which is pretty much the biggest thing on the Australian music calendar every year. And people vote on their favorite song of the year. This year, Kendrick Lamar won with his song, Humble. Now, I do not like Kendrick Lamar or his song Humble. It's not really my thing. But because so many people like Kendrick Lamar, I thought to myself, there's got to be something in this. So I went out and I did some research and I learned that to a lot of people, Kendrick Lamar brings a down to earth humility and emotional vulnerability to his music that most other hip hop artists don't. He's still rapping about money and bitches and whatever else, but he's talking about them differently in a way that means something to a lot of people. He feels real and people always like what feels real. Now, knowing this doesn't make me like Kendrick's music anymore. I've listened to some more of it. I still don't, just, it's just not for me, right? But I do respect it more and I understand why people speak about it the way that they do. Even though his music isn't for me personally, it's clear that it's making a contribution to the hip hop genre in a way that very few people are doing right now. That makes his work important and worth paying attention to 
even if I personally don't enjoy it. I say this now because there's gonna be a lot of you out there who watch this review and think I am an idiot and that my assessment of this game couldn't be more wrong. You might look at this game as slow and clunky and repetitive and badly designed and just plain boring. You might hate this game and my review of it, a review which proudly declares it one of the greatest games ever made. And it's gonna sound particularly crazy to you as I say all of this. I get that, but I'd ask you to suspend for the next little while your personal preferences and dispositions and listen to what I have to say. Because just like Kendrick Lamar is making a contribution to the hip hop scene that in the view of many is reshaping the genre, Monster Hunter World, now that it's on shelves, is in the process of reshaping the gaming landscape as we know it. And no, I'm not exaggerating. For over a decade now, Monster Hunter has dominated Japan the way that Call of Duty dominates here. I was actually in Japan back in 2015 when Monster Hunter X had just released and you couldn't swing a palico without seeing Monster Hunter advertising absolutely everywhere you went. They were selling this game, like literally this is no word of a lie, in 7-Eleven, true story. The Japanese go crazy for it, and there's a very simple explanation for why. It's very, very good. But for whatever reason, Capcom just wasn't able to bring Monster Hunter to a Western audience on a mainstream console. Heaps of releases across the Nintendo DS lineup, and the PSP, and the Vita, and even the Wii, but none of these were at the right time or on the right platform, such that Joe Console would look at the game in their local GameStop and trade in his 35 games to get his $20 off the ticket price. But last year, at E3 2017, Capcom let the Palico out of the bag. By the way, I really hope you're enjoying these Palico puns. Plenty more to come. They revealed Monster Hunter World. Built from the ground up for modern day consoles and the PC, and so graphically accomplished that the Nintendo Switch couldn't even handle it. Well, at least not now. Maybe they'll port it later on, but who knows. Finally, the Monster Hunter game that Western fans have been waiting for was on its way, and we all held our breath, waiting for the day it would come. Certain that it would be Good, because Monster Hunter is always good, but naturally cautious that the move to cater to a Western audience would see a tried and proven formula perfected over generations, compromised in a way that would leave a mark on an otherwise unblemished record. The cross is the mark, by the way. So, how did it do? Well, Monster Hunter World is just... I mean, it is just... Monster Hunter World is just... It is impossible for me to fully communicate how magnificent this game is, but I can start by saying that the West will now talk about Monster Hunter the same way that we do the Elder Scrolls series, or Dark Souls, or Resident Evil, or Street Fighter, or Mario. I mention each of these games not because they're amazing games, but because they popularized entirely new genres, and the lessons they taught us about video games ripples out beyond those singular experiences. Monster Hunter was already the defining Monster Hunter style game because there wasn't really much competition, but this game delivers on the promise of the Monster Hunter concept so perfectly and does so with such tremendous style and polish that the impact of this game will spill over into places you'd never expect for many years to come. Quick story time. Last year, I reviewed Neat Automata because I played it and then I watched all these other reviews out there and even though they were all loving it, giving, you know, 9 out of 10, I felt like a crazy person because to me, no one had properly communicated just how incredible and what a masterpiece Nier Automata was. I reviewed that game and that review went on to become the most watched Nier review on YouTube. And the reason for that, I think, is because I think that review gave voice to what people sensed but weren't hearing from others. Later that year, I reviewed Warframe, a game that no one was talking about back then, even though it was one of the top 10 most played games on Steam. As soon as I played that game, I knew there was something exceptional in it, and I said as much in my review. And that video went on to become the most viewed Warframe review on YouTube, because again, I think it gave voice to what the Warframe community knew to be true, and what newcomers sensed when they first picked up the game. 
I make these comparisons now not to blow my own Palico horn, but because having completed Monster Hunter World, I sensed in it the same greatness I sensed in those other games. And my mission today is to create a review that tells that story, that celebrates this achievement, that showcases to the world, be they rusted on Monster Hunter veteran or brand spanking newbie, just what an incredible video game this is, and why I think it immediately takes its place in Gaming's Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, I very proudly present to you my review of Monster Hunter World. This is the original Monster Hunter, released on the PS2 in Japan way back in 2004. Looks kind of familiar, right? It's tempting to say that Monster Hunter World is just a new and better version of the same Monster Hunter we've been playing for years, and let's just skip straight to the part where we talk about why this version is so good. The only problem with that is that the overwhelming majority of you watching this video, this will be the very first Monster Hunter game that you play, and many of you won't actually know what sort of game that is. I've literally had people ask me, Skill Up, is this game like Horizon Zero Dawn? Is it like The Witcher? Is it like Dark Souls? Is it like Doki Doki Literature Club? Okay, no one asked me that, but still, you get the point. Veterans, please bear with me because now we're going to spend some time explaining what this game is so that we're all on the same page with what it's about. Monster Hunter is at this point its own genre because there's really nothing else doing what it does. I mean, there have been some games that have tried and are still trying, like the recently released free-to-play PC game Dauntless, but really nothing comes close to Monster Hunter. It's a whole different ballpark. It's like Dark Souls, sure, there are other games like it, like Lawbreakers, for example. I think we've kind of made the Dark Souls of a uh, competitive first-person shooter. But Dark Souls owns the Souls-like genre in the same way that Monster Hunter owns the monster hunting genre. It's its own little island on the gaming landscape, though I suspect that with the success of Monster Hunter World, that will soon change. So what genre is it then? What are we doing in this game? Well, like the name suggests, you're hunting monsters. You're tracking them through their environments, finding them, kicking the shit out of them for anywhere between 20 and 50 minutes, and then carving them up for parts, which you'll then use to craft gear. That gear makes you stronger so that you can then take on tougher monsters and earn better gear so that you can then take on tougher monsters and collect better gear. Those of you paying attention will have no doubt already guessed that this is a looter of sorts, where the objective of the game is to collect more and more loot. But it's important to understand how that loot grinding loop works because it's quite different from something like Diablo or The Division, where the actual items you want are the things that drop. Here instead, it's the materials that drop and you use those to craft. So in that way, the loot economy is a lot more like Warframe, only there's no option to pay to skip the grind, which is something we'll talk about later in the review. So we all know it's an action game, it's a looter. What about the structure of the game, how it's all pieced together? Well, it's not an open world game, firstly. There are five separate playable areas, and you'll essentially queue for missions to kill specific monsters in each of those regions. So here you are in your very impressive town, you'll go up to the quest board or the quest handler, your waifu, you'll select the mission and you want to do it then, you get ported to the mission area so that you can then track the monster, kill it, take its parts, and then go back home. That's it, right? There is a story to this game, but it's like the story of your average, like, 3D platformer, maybe. Oh, the princess is gonna bake a cake for me, and now she can't, damn it, I really like cake, I better go save her. I'm exaggerating slightly, because Capcom have actually put in a fair amount of effort into the cutscenes and the like. You can tell that they were trying to deliver more than what the series has typically delivered in the past, but ultimately, the narrative only serves as a vehicle to get you from one area to the next, to the next fight, and so on and so on. If you want a good story, go play near Automata or something. Do not play this game because it's not a story-driven experience. You will be disappointed in the story. Please know that this is not a story-driven game. What else? Well, you can play the entire thing co-op if you like, and yes, the matchmaking on Xbox and PSN is pretty busted at the moment, but they'll fix it eventually. A lot of people say that co-op is the best way to play this game, and I sort of agree, but I sort of don't for reasons that I'll talk about later in this review. Either way, if co-op is your thing, then this game has got you covered from start to finish. 
Oh, and there's no PvP at all, none whatsoever. Now, you're gonna spend about 50 hours playing through the campaign of this game, and around half of that will be at what's called low rank, and the other half is at what's called high rank, where you fight a lot of the same monsters you fought earlier, you just fight harder versions of them, with some new monsters thrown in there as well that are specific to high rank. All in all, there are 27 monsters to take down across the whole game, which isn't as many as in previous Monster Hunter games, but the encounters are way, way more complex and interesting, so it feels like there's a lot more game here to enjoy. High rank is the hardest mode available. There's no G rank like in previous games, though they have said that they will consider bringing that later on. So when you hit the end game, the gear grind continues infinitely because there's just so much to collect and so many build options available to you, which again, we'll talk about soon. And I know I keep saying that, but each of these things that I'm mentioning, there's just so much to say. They're so fantastic that I can't just briefly mention them. I have to talk about them properly. So bear with me, we will get through it all. Now, this is the game, ladies and gentlemen. You fight, you put up with some crappy cutscenes, you kill some mobs, you rip out their organs and wear them like a hat, and you just keep doing that for days. So already you've probably made up your mind as to whether or not this game is for you, because it doesn't offer so many things that I know people love, like a good story, or characters, or immediately accessible pick up and play gameplay, or PvP, or heaps of things. If I have one piece of advice about how to approach Monster Hunter, it's that you need to approach approach it on its terms. It's not your typical AAA game. It isn't designed around your busy schedule. If you have a short attention span, it certainly isn't designed around that either. It isn't interested in giving you something quick and fun. Monster Hunter is long, hard work, but like most things in life that are hard, it's certainly worth it in the end. So, now that I've explained what it's all about, it's time to sell it. It's time to talk about why this game is so damn magnificent, and there's no better starting point than in the name itself, Monster Hunter World. When I was at school, we read Lord of the Flies. Nope. Yeah, that's the one. It's about some kids stranded on a tropical island and they end up killing each other. It's like the PUBG of books. Anyway, there was a word in it that I had never heard before at the tender age of 15, and that word was festoon. Festoons. Cool word, huh? Its plural is even cooler. Festoonery. A festoon is a decorative chain or strip hung between things or around things. You know how people get married in those wedding arches? Well, the vines covering the arch are what you call festoons. Now, in the book, the passage reads, allowed the strings of the parachute to tangle and festoon. And here the author William Golding is being clever because while he's describing the parachute strings, he's also creating a sense of what it's like to be on this island, which has this tropical jungle at the center of it. The way he writes, you get a sense that this place is thick and impenetrable, and that vision has always stayed with me because the way he writes that place in that book, it's very powerful imagery that conveys a tremendous sense of place. Jungles and outdoor spaces are pretty common features in video games. I think about a game like Uncharted, which spent a hell of a lot of time in various jungles, and I think that like most other games, it does a pretty average job of conveying a sense of place. You sort of feel like you're walking through these jungle corridors and they all seem like video game levels. They don't feel particularly authentic. I don't feel claustrophobic or overwhelmed in these spaces and it feels more like a walk in the park than it does a walk through a jungle. Now I'm not picking on Uncharted here, lots of games struggle with this, but I'll tell you one game that does not struggle with this, Monster Hunter World. The five environments that you'll spend your time in in this game are simply phenomenal by every possible game design metric. First of all, they look amazing. You step into them and the first vistas you see at the very starting point are just spectacular and every new major section you step into is more visually striking than the last. I mean, you unlock the last area around 35 hours into the game and through every hour of the preceding 35 hours, you are just constantly looking around, soaking it all in because the design work that's gone into it is some of the best art design you've ever seen in open world video game levels. But much more than that is the feeling of these levels. The jungles are so dense and twisting and turning and narrow and you feel like you're pushing through it all. You feel like you've got a machete in hand carving your own path through it. You push away some vines to reveal a new secret spot that leads to a new set of vines that will give you some much needed materials or a new NPC who'll unlock something useful back at your base. 
And if it isn't dense jungle, it's barren desert, or it's rivers of lava, or it's lofty peaks that literally see you go up through the clouds in order to reach them, or it's crystal encrusted canyons, man, try saying that three times fast, just like we've seen in a few other video games, but here again, beautiful, stunning, striking, and unforgettable. The game feels like a true adventure, because in an adventure, the location is half the fun. It's not an adventure if you're just doing shit in your office, that's just a bad day. But the same shit happening out on a pirate ship, now that is an adventure. Every time I queue up for another hunt, I get the honest to goodness excitement of wondering where it will take me this time, because these levels are so big that you'll be blown away by them. They are multi-layered, and just when you thought you've reached the bottom, it turns out that there was a whole other section you've never noticed, and that's where you'll be heading next. The best part though, is that these levels are expertly designed to be arenas for you to be fighting these monsters. There is a purpose to that sunken sand in the middle of that area, it collapses when a monster lands on it and you crash through the floor to continue the fight below just like dead or alive. This dam here, it will explode if the monster you're fighting rams into it and that dragon will literally get washed down the cliffside if that happens. These little ledges and pillars here, they're all there for a reason so that you can do jumping attacks and mount monsters when the time is right. You're gonna find that as you come to know these environments, you're gonna understand them as deeply as you would a level in a competitive shooter or the map in League of Legends or Dota. You know these places, their sight lines, their high grounds, their low grounds, the places that see you protected and those that leave you exposed. You're gonna know how to take advantage of every section of this map and you'll absolutely need to know that because just as you've come to know these maps, so too do the monsters that inhabit them. And in fact, much like predators in real life, the monsters in Monster Hunter are experts in using their natural surroundings to their advantage. Just one of the many things that make these monsters some of the best boss battles you will ever have in your time playing video games. So, let's take a look now at what makes your foes so damn special. I was chatting recently with a game designer friend of mine, a guy that works for a major publisher, and we were both talking about how fantastic we thought Monster Hunter World was. He described it as a masterpiece, and I fully agree with that. I'm just not using that word here because I kind of use it a lot in the past, and I think people will start rolling their eyes if I call every damn game a masterpiece. Anyway, we were talking about what makes this game so great, and he said the structure of the game's monsters reminded him of a book he read on game design called A Theory of Fun by Raf Costa, a very famous book in game design circles that I'd never heard of until he mentioned it. Well, I read a summary of the book and I also found these slides that he presented 10 years after the initial publication of the book and they outline the core thesis of the book. And this is the slide that summarizes it best. It says, fun in games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It's the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. With games, learning is the drug. It seemed like such a self-evident concept when you write it down, but it's something I'd never really considered before. And as I reflected on my favorite ever gaming experiences, I realized that most of them were my favorite because of this concept. Halo 2 was incredible because I was on a constant learning curve to memorize the maps and weapon spawn locations and sight lines and exactly how many pistol shots it would take to bring down another Spartan, etc, etc. The best moments we have in those games is when we draw from the deep well of our own learning, from dozens or hundreds or thousands of hours invested, and we apply that learning in a single moment to overcome. The feeling of satisfaction we get when we drop our opponent or that boss dies exists because we invested the time before that to learn how to do it. Monster Hunter World, like World of Warcraft or Fury or Bloodborne or Shadow of the Colossus or any other challenging PvE focused game, it's entirely about that moment of overcoming. It's about that last strike when the boss finally keels over and you get this incredible rush of satisfaction and relief and elation knowing that you overcame that challenge and that you fully earned that success. But for that feeling to truly exist, the feeling of overcoming, the boss battles need to not only be hard, but good. Deus Ex Human Evolution had these boss battles that were unbelievably badly designed and basically impossible, so much so that the studio eventually went on to blame another studio who they apparently outsourced the boss battles to. 
it's not enough for a challenge to be hard, it has to also be fair. And it's in this regard that Monster Hunter World establishes itself as a game with world-class, industry-leading encounter design, the likes of which you will only see a few times in your lifetime. Each of the 27 bosses you face in this game is a perfectly constructed action puzzle. The visual design of the monster is the starting point. If it's got a tail, it's going to try and swing it at you. If it has a big bulky head, it's going to try and ram you with it. If it's got wings, it's going to fly just above you out of reach. If it's radiating fire, it's going to burn you. If it's covered in spikes, it's going to try and skewer you. You can look at pretty much every monster in this game and guess what a lot of its moveset is going to be based on the visual design of the monster. And that is genius. It makes these enemies feel real, organic, like living creatures rather than just video game bosses. Like, look at this guy for example. What the fuck does he do? I, I, no one knows what this guy does. He just looks like a floating sword handle or something. Or basically any boss from Bayonetta. I have no idea what any of these things are going to do to me until I eventually start hitting it and then it kills me and that's how I learn what the boss's moves are. And that's fine because Bayonetta is awesome, don't get me wrong. But with Monster Hunter, you can guess half of the encounters just by looking at the enemy because the visual design and their mechanics mechanics are remarkably congruent. And I don't want you to think that this means that the encounters will be repetitive, because they're just all so different. With the exception of one or two reskinned enemies, the encounters have such a different feel to them every time. Take this guy for example. He's a big dragon thing that you'll have to fight quite a few times during the game. And then look at this guy, another dragon. Now, they kind of look similar, right? Sure, I mean, one has horns and the other one doesn't, but you could be forgiven for confusing the two of these at first. But let me tell you that there is nothing similar about the way that these two beasts fight. This one is a straight up dragon and he flies around a lot and he breathes fire on you like all the other dragon stuff you'd expect, that's him. But look at this other guy, he's bigger and he's more heavily armored. So he actually spends most of his time on the ground because it almost feels like he's too heavy to fly. And see those big horns he has, those aren't just for show. He is constantly trying to ram you with those things because just like animals in the real world, his anatomy is his weapon and he uses that to the best of his ability to be as lethal as possible. Fighting this guy feels like fighting a dragon, but fighting this guy feels like you're fighting a bull. These bosses look the same on the surface, but the subtle visual details speak to the vastly different combat mechanics that lay in wait for you when you eventually engage these enemies. And that's honestly saying something. I've never seen this so well executed in a video game before. But it doesn't stop there either. Remember when I talked about environment design and how enemies use their environment to their advantage? Let me show you what I mean by once again, leaning on our old friend, Diablo. So, you kick the shit out of this guy long enough and eventually he'll retreat back to his lair. Now, up to this point, he's been using a move where he tunnels underground and then appears underneath you to try and knock you over. And he's also been charging at you like a bull. So what happens in here is that he combines these moves with the environment, which has these sand waterfalls that are obstructing your view. So he'll dig underground, he'll go behind one of the sand waterfalls and then he'll come out through the sand charging at you. And you have to be super ready for that because not seeing his trajectory at the start of that move makes it way, way harder to dodge. And that's just one example of that. This dragon does something similar, sheathing itself in wind to obstruct your view before charging at you. This guy pulls you into an area where you're taking constant damage and then he applies a bleed to you to make it even harder. This guy, you spend the entire fight knocking his armor off him, and then he retreats to his lair, he rolls around on this big pile of bones to regain his armor, so you then need to knock it all over once again. There are 27 bosses in this game, and almost all of them have been designed in such a way that they use their environment to their advantage, either during the fight or towards the end, to constitute this final, desperate fight for survival. You really get this sense towards the end of these encounters that animal instinct is truly kicking in as these monsters desperately cling to life by any means necessary. And it's in this desperate struggle for survival that you'll find your most frustrating and rewarding Monster Hunter moments. Because you will die a lot, but eventually you will overcome. And the genius of this game from a game design perspective is that the fair part of the overcome equation is expertly delivered. Imagine a line going up on a graph. This is the game's difficulty. It's just so finely tuned at every point of the game. It always feels just right. 
because the curve is actually comprised of stronger monsters, more complex movesets, more dangerous environments, more challenging mission conditions. And encasing all of this is a visual presence that communicates all of these things to the player so that they sense it so intuitively. You know that this place or this monster is more dangerous than the last just by looking at it, just as you know that this piece of armor or this weapon is more powerful because of the way it looks. And it cannot be overstated just how hard it is to achieve that sort of difficulty balance in a video game. Capcom have truly outdone themselves here. I said earlier that you can play this game co-op and a lot of people enjoy that more and I certainly agree, that's really fun. But if you want my advice, I'd strongly recommend playing this game through solo first. It's going to really push you to understand the game and its encounters far more deeply. You'll see all of the things that I'm describing here more clearly, and you'll get that sense of overcoming. You just won't get that in the same way when you're playing co-op. It's like Ornstein and S'more in Dark Souls. You can pull other players into this fight, but if you do, you suck, okay? That fight will make a man of you if you face it solo, and anything else is just cheating. Now, it's not quite the same with Monster Hunter, since the game really focuses on the co-op aspect a lot more, but trust me, it's worth seeing and worth doing on your own the very first time through. Let's go! If you can, go back and play Mario 64. Of all the genius that that game brought to the table, its crowning achievement was how it felt to control Mario. I mean, even today, you pick up that controller and it's just fun to walk around, to jump, to slide, to backflip, to wall kick, to whatever. It just feels so perfect. And that's one of the biggest things that I look for in a game. It's one of the reasons that I love Destiny 1 so much. There wasn't much to Destiny in vanilla, but playing Destiny always just felt so right. You had this connection to your weapon that you just don't get in many other places. You sort of felt it shudder as you pulled the trigger and you knew how to ride the recoil and you knew how the auto aim would kick in and help you out and when it wouldn't, it just felt beautiful. For an action game, this sense of merely combat feeling just right is really hard to achieve. If you take something like God of War, to me personally, that didn't feel as good as, say, Devil May Cry or Bayonetta. God of War felt like I was kind of just pushing buttons to do these combos, but with Bayonetta and Devil May Cry, there was a weightiness to each swing and movement animation that just made it feel really fun to pick up and play even after I'd finished it the first time. All right, we're going to earn ourselves some dislikes here, but ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Everybody in the West holds up Dark Souls as the gold standard for third-person melee combat design. And don't get me wrong, it's fantastic. I love it, in fact. And I'm someone that's played all the Souls games, including Demon Souls, and I've finished each of them two or three different times. As an avid fan of the entire Souls series, I have no problem telling you that Monster Hunter's merely combat design completely shits all over Dark Souls. There is no comparison. Everyone's all like, the combat in Monster Hunter feels like Dark Souls. No, my friend, the combat in Dark Souls feels like Monster Hunter. It's just a less good version of it. So. I made some bold claims then, let's back them up. The easiest way to understand the magnificence of Monster Hunter World's weapon design is to understand that it's a game that's been in development for essentially 14 years. The original game came out back in 2004 and every game since then has reused and expanded the weapon roster. It's now up to 14 weapons and this game actually didn't introduce any new weapons at all. They literally just lifted the same roster from the previous game. Most games, especially sequels, will go to great lengths to redesign their weapons significantly with each iteration because they want their game to feel fresh for players. Monster Hunter takes a totally different approach. It adds one or two weapons to each new game and it focuses the rest of the development time on further refining the existing suite of weapons. And that's what I mean when I say that the reason it all works so well is because it's been in development for 14 years. Almost no other game has the same commitment to continuously improving and refining the same limited suite of weapons. And as a result, the design of each of them is so deep and layered that they could literally be the main weapon of entire games. The same way that Dante's sword is his staple, or Kratos' axe, or Aloy's bow, Wait, wait, yes, yes, let's let's go with this, okay? 
Imagine all of the best weapons you've ever used in games. So, Killick's Staff from Soul Calibur, or the Sword and Board of a World of Warcraft Warrior, or the Massive Hammer of Reinhardt, or the Buster Sword of Cloud, or the Katana of Sephiroth. Now, just imagine a better version of each of those weapons. That's Monster Hunt's weapon system right there. It's like a gaming weapon hall of fame all on the one disc. Let's talk about my favorite weapon as an example, the Kinsek Glaive. Now this is a bow staff that I can swing to hit things. I can do light jabs or heavy arcing swings depending on the buttons I press and how I time it all. With enough practice, I can eventually open up some really big combos as well, which feel great. Pretty interesting, huh? No, wrong. We haven't even got to the interesting stuff yet. If I press R2 and X, I'll perform a little pole vault shooting me up into the air to either dodge attacks or allow me to hit the enemy as I come hurtling down. And if I'm lucky, I can actually mount the monster and start damaging him. Now that's pretty interesting, right? Wrong again! Stop agreeing with me. The best part is this little dude who lives on my arm. He's the Kinsect. He's part of the weapon and I can fire him at the enemy and depending on which part of the enemy's body I hit, I'll get a certain buff that increases damage, defense or speed. And when I get all three of these buffs active at once, every single one of my previous moves that I earlier described changes to a completely different moveset that is faster, stronger and more dangerous. So the Kinsect Glaive is this spectacular aerial dance of dodging and mounting and buffing and debuffing and when all of it clicks into place I just become this whirlwind of destruction and it's just... Man, it's just, it's the best. Now, there's stuff about the Kinsect Glaive that I didn't even describe yet, like its elemental alignments, the passive buffs it brings, the effect that my Kinsect Dust has on the enemy, the defensive maneuverability of my combos, heaps and heaps of stuff. That's why people like Arix and Gaijin Hunter put out these 20 minute videos explaining how to use one weapon, because they're literally that deep and complex. And I've only just described part of one weapon. There are 13 others that I haven't even mentioned yet, and all of them are just as deep and as interesting as the Kinsect Blade. The weapon design in this game is in a league of its own, and a huge part of the Monster Hunter experience is just learning how to use each of them, since they honestly feel like their own game. And accompanying all of that innovative design is this terrific animation rigging at the core combat loop. Combat in this game is going to feel very clunky the first time you play it. It's going to feel almost bad. But it's not bad, you're bad. No offense, we're all bad when we start Monster Hunter. Eventually, the weight and rhythm and flow of your chosen weapon will reveal itself to you, and you'll get a sense of the way your weight is shifting, the orientation of your shoulders, the time between your attacks, and the difference between a solid hit and a deflection. You'll start to feel a connection to your weapon that you're very unlikely to feel in most other games, and much like with Destiny, where I used to just log on to feel the feeling of pulling the trigger, I now just log on to Monster Hunter just to feel the feeling of swinging my weapon. I honestly love it so much. And lay it on top of what is the best third person melee combat system in the entire gaming landscape is this wonderfully deep and rewarding RPG gearing system that gives you so much flexibility to determine how you play. I'll show you my build for example. Here are all the different types of Kinsec Blades that I can use, and I've gone for a full poison focused Kinsec Blade that deals poison damage, and the dust my Kinsec leaves behind when it strikes an enemy also does poison damage. Now my gear is where the synergy really emerges, because I've opted for some bonus poison damage on three of my gear pieces, coupled with some bonus defense and some attack power and a few odds and ends thrown in here and there. But I've also got a wish list in game, which actually tracks my progress towards each of the items that I'm looking to collect and updates as I get more and more of the materials. And here you can see I'm going for a build that focuses on critical damage as well. So it's a very offensive build I've got going on here. So I just showed you like three different armor perks and here are all of the armor perks. There are so many of them and pretty much any playstyle you can think of, you can build for it. You can literally refine a build that focuses on aerial attacks or increase guard when blocking with a shield or a chance to paralyze your target or speedy evasion focus build or one that specializes in killing a very specific type of monster or whatever you please. You'll often hear the refrain that there's thousands of hours of gameplay in a single Monster Hunter game and when people say that, this is ultimately what they're talking about. It's the endless gear grind to collect hundreds of different weapons and armor pieces and to gem them with the best possible decorations and to combine them in the most interesting, fun and effective ways to allow you to enjoy the game as you please. It's very akin to something like Warframe, where there's a fairly complex system at work that takes you a while to understand, 
But when you do, you're going to appreciate the flexibility that it gives you and the longevity it affords the overall experience. If you start enjoying Monster Hunter, you're probably going to be playing it for a long time. And that's good news for the simple reason that Monster Hunter, the franchise, is one of the most honest, generous and consumer focused AAA game franchises in the world today. And if you don't believe me, let me show you. Two thousand and seventeen was a pretty shit year for the business of video games. Ironically, we had some of the best releases in history, but we also had this strange coalescence of shitty business practices with the majority of the major publishers all throwing their weight behind loot boxes. Now, I won't get into why loot boxes suck so much. I have a whole separate channel that's pretty much exclusively devoted to that. But I will say that there was, at the lowest points in 2017, a belief that it was all hopeless and it was all only going to get worse as publishers continue down the glorified gambling rabbit hole. Now, Capcom aren't exactly the golden children when it comes to paid DLC, being one of the great pioneers of the whole on-disc DLC fiasco. But Monster Hunter has always been a bit of a special case for the publisher. For whatever reason, Capcom had a very strong commitment to giving away lots and lots of free DLC for Monster Hunter games. Here's a line from the last DLC news post for the most recent Monster Hunter game, just to give you an idea of what I mean. That's it for the DLC for Monster Hunter Generations. We hope you enjoyed all the additions to an already massive game. In total, we've brought you over 90 new quests, over 40 new weapons, over 15 complete armor sets, and over 30 equipment sets for your new fear lines. And it was all free! Exclamation mark. Now, you tell me, when was the last time a game you bought, especially a AAA one, pushed out that volume of free content? And this story continues here with Monster Hunter World, where the developer has already promised the release of plenty of free DLC to expand your adventure, with a new monster soon being added, as well as new themed armor sets based on Horizon Zero Dawn and Street Fighter. Seriously, this isn't Photoshop, you are actually going to be able to play as Ryu in Monster Hunter World. If the previous 40 minutes of this review haven't already sold you on the game, that I'm sure you are reaching for your credit card at this point. But more than any of that, I want to really stress this point. This game feels complete right now, right out of the box. As a channel, it's sort of become my bread and butter to go back and look at how games that launched in a really shitty state eventually became good games. Games like Destiny, or The Division, or Warframe, or Nier Automata. I'm just kidding, that was amazing, except for the PC port. With Monster Hunter World, you reach the end game, and there is not the slightest doubt in your mind that this $60 product that you paid for was worth every dime, and that the game was well and truly finished. It's a complete product in every possible sense of the word, and it's just so refreshing to see a game as ambitious as this achieve such a level of excellence and completeness. When developers like Bioware are already foreshadowing that Anthem will go through the same growing pains that Destiny did. I mean, the game's not even out yet, and already they're making excuses for why it won't be finished at launch. No thank you. I think we've all become a bit numb to rampant, exploitative monetization, but Monster Hunter World, in addition to being an exceptional video game, grabs us by the shoulders and shakes us back to our commercial senses, reminding us that when we pay for a video game, we should get what we paid for and then some. It feels like a low bar to clear, and it is, but it's just so worth pointing out in this modern day. Now you'll notice that as I've gone through this review, I really haven't talked much about any of the bad stuff, and that has to do with my approach as a reviewer. If if the game is terrible, then let's explain why it's terrible and move on. Let's not bother talking about the one or two things that it goes right, because if the overall experience sucks, then you shouldn't play it. And what's the point of knowing it had really good, I don't know, ring design? If a game is pretty good, then I think it's important to talk about the good and the bad. Assassin's Creed Origin falls into this bucket for me, and I'm currently scripting a review for that game that spends a lot of time talking about what I think the game gets right and what it gets wrong, because I think the overall experience is actually going to be pretty mixed for a lot of players. But with Monster Hunter World, this game is so fucking phenomenal that I would be wasting my time if I said to you, oh, it's hard to matchmake sometimes, or oh, the camera can get funky sometimes. I mean, I could spend one minute of this review talking about why this scripted boss battle isn't really fun, 
or I could spend that time talking about the fact that at any point during any one of your hunts, when you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe against some fearsome monster, another monster can just swoop in and immediately start kicking the shit out of the monster you were fighting. And then you're just standing there watching these two things fight it out and you're all like... Uh? It's like that scene in Jurassic Park when the raptors are about to eat everyone for dinner and then the T-Rex just rocks up and he's all like... Now, with moments as epic as these littered throughout this game, you tell me which you'd rather me spend time talking about in a review. If there's any legitimate criticism that might be leveled at this game, it's that it's still ultimately just a Monster Hunter game. If we're gonna flay Destiny 2 for being too similar to Destiny 1, for not ideating enough on the formula, then why wouldn't we do the same thing here? Well, there's two answers to this, and the first is that they did ideate in Monster Hunter World on pretty much everything. It's the same core Monster Hunter formula we've always known, but it's just better. Like, all of it is just better, and not by a little bit, by a lot. Quality of life, encounter designs, map design, the fluidity of the movement and combat, all of it is a step up, so we really have to recognize that first. And on top of this is an X factor that comes from finally being able to play it on modern consoles, on large television screens, in a level of visual fidelity that can only be achieved by the Xbox and the PlayStation and the PC. You know those movies where there's some really hot girl but she dresses in all nerdy clothes and she's wearing glasses and no one pays attention to her? That was Monster Hunter on Nintendo DS. And then later in the movie, she loses the glasses and puts on a cocktail dress and then the coolest guy in school is all like, whoa, that's Monster Hunter World. That's what this is. It's those scenes in those movies where everyone finally realizes that the thing no one has been paying attention to is actually the best of all the things. And now we're all just falling over ourselves to get our hands on it. Hence the news that Monster Hunter World sold more than 5 million copies in its first week. More than the entire lifetime sales of the previously most successful Monster Hunter game. I said at the beginning of this review that Monster Hunter will change the gaming landscape here in the West. If 5 million copies sold in the first week, before the PC version is even released, isn't evidence enough of that, then I don't know what is. It's more than just sales though. COD sold more copies this year than almost any COD in history, but its relevance and impact continues to decline as gaming moves on to the next thing. In the West, Monster Hunter is at the beginning of its arc, and Monster Hunter World will serve as a punctuation point in our industry. Its excellence will be recognized by more and more people, and the lessons it teaches us about video games will be absorbed into more and more titles, because like other genre-defining games that came before it, it fully delivers on the promise of a worthwhile idea in a way that few games can ever hope to achieve. Go and play Monster Hunter, see it and experience it, because just like Kendrick Lamar, it may not be for you, but it's doing something worth paying attention to. Congratulations Capcom, you really nailed it with this one.